All right, it's been a while since I've done an expository study, so I wanted to do the, an expository study of the book of Ephesians. So if you want to turn in your Bible, King James Bible, of course, to Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to go through the book of Ephesians. And this week we're going to be doing chapter 1. And uh, there are two heresies out there um, in our world today that base their system, it's foundational verses are found here in the book of Ephesians. Uh, first of all, you have Calvinism and hyper-Calvinism, the more serious of the error, and they base their truth mostly on Ephesians chapter 1. Now, they'll take other verses as well to try and support it, but um, you can watch my study on that, Predestinated to Not Be a Calvinist, and I get into a lot more detail than I'm going to in this study on the thing of Calvinism, refuting Calvinism, but uh, they base their truth on Ephesians chapter 1, the other heresy is hyper-dispensationalism. A lot of people try to put that on me that I'm a hyper-dispensationalist. I'm not. A hyper-dispensationalist makes two different bodies of Christ. You have Jesus to Paul, Paul to the rapture. So Peter, James, John, those guys are in the church of the one body. They're the first one there. And then Paul and the rest of us are in the other church or something like this. It, it's nutty nonsense. Okay, um, they get all mixed up. But uh, they get their truth from Ephesians chapter 3, I believe it is. And we're going to be covering that when we get to that week, two weeks from now. So this week we're going to cover Ephesians chapter 1. And we will see, and we'll make some comments about Calvinism. But like I said, if you want the whole detailed study, then uh, watch the predestinated to not be a Calvinist sermon for more on that. So let's begin here. Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 1 through 3. It says here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Okay. Now, as I stated in my other sermon on Calvinism, the thing that you need to get from those first three verses there is the term there blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Okay, You're, The only reason you have anything, the only reason that you are anything in God's sight is because of your relationship with Christ. The fact that you are in Christ. Ironically, the term in Christ, that exact saying there, in Christ, appears ten times in the book of Ephesians. So it's a, it's a sort of an important thing that gets established. Paul establishes it right there at the very beginning that you are in Christ. That's why you call yourself a Christian. You know, um, I don't really believe in denominational names, calling myself a Baptist. or you know, I had somebody say the one time, well, calling yourself a King James Bible believer is uh, just another denominational title. No, it's not. It's a description. Um, I believe the King James Bible. I have no other confessions, no other creeds, no catechisms, no anything, church councils, whatever. I don't have anything like that. Um, I just believe the Bible, King James Bible. And you know, I know people can then label you with that and whatever else, but you know, all I am, I'm just a Christian. A King James Bible believing Christian is what I am. I'm in Christ. So my inheritance comes through that relationship with Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. If you know anything about this ministry, you're probably going, oh, he's turning to the verse again. Yes, I am. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, a lot of times when I talk about that verse, I specifically am talking about real versus false conversion. And I say somebody's in Christ, there's going to be a new creature, they're going to have a new life, things that have changed. When, and that's certainly true. But there's another way to look at this thing. See, that's kind of looking at it from the negative, saying, you know, there's a stipulation there. If you are in Christ, there needs to be a change. But look at it the other way. If you are in Christ, things have gotten better for you. Right? I mean, over here in Ephesians chapter 1, it said, blessed us with all spiritual blessings. In heavenly places in Christ you know so salvation there you know there is a changed life there but what is part of the change part of the change is going I know where I'm going when I die 
I know I have some great things coming to me when I die. You know, right now, I am not very wealthy by worldly standards, by American standards, I should say, by other country standards, I'm very wealthy, but, um, you know, I don't have very much. I, don't, I, I drive a pickup truck that's 20 years old. I live in an old house and that's falling apart and things like that, you know, and, and uh, whatever. But by heavenly standards, you compare my heavenly inheritance and your heavenly inheritance that's coming to you with the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the whoever's of this world, the rich of this world, there's no comparison. I mean, we're going to be living in mansions made of gold, streets of gold, walking around. I mean, walking on gold. That's going to be pretty amazing. But how do you get there? By being in Christ, having that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It says here, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, real quickly to kind of um, recap the what the teachings of Calvinism is. The teaching of Calvinism is that God, right there in verse 4, that he chose you before the foundation of the world, you know, that you are chosen to be saved before he even created you, and therefore you really have no part in salvation. It's just all, you know, you're kind of forced into it, essentially. You can't make the decision one way or the other, uh, which you just go on to read the rest of the chapter, and that's disproved. But there's another big problem there. If you want to keep your hand there in Ephesians chapter 1, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I've talked about this in my study on Calvinism, but we'll just go over it again if you haven't heard that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 through 49 says here, And so it is written, The first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, now look at this, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, this passage right here is all you need to, dis de to debunk this whole thing if you were pre-chosen before the foundation of the world. It doesn't work. Why? Because if you were pre-chosen from before the foundation of the world, then it would be spiritual first and then fleshly. In other words, you're pre-chosen you're born into sin, and then you have to get saved later. You know, doesn't work. See, the Calvinists have it backwards. The, the reality of it is you're born into sin. And only after you come to a personal saving faith in Jesus Christ, then comes the spiritual. Then you are in Christ. You're not in Christ before the foundation of the world. You say, well, then what's it mean over here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4? The thing there that's verse 4 according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us uh, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will you know what's going on there is the Lord's saying I'm going to make a way for my creation to come to heaven that doesn't mean he pre-chose you he pre-chose himself to be the way of salvation that's what's going on there. He is the way. God is the way of salvation. All right? There is no other way to heaven other than through the means that God provides. All right? That's what's going on there. Now let's go next to verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says here, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now we're going to go to Colossians, just turn over two books to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Interesting that the new versions, many of them take out this thing through his blood there in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. They take it out there, but they'll leave it in over here in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. 
you know, and you'll hear these guys and they'll say, you can still get the teaching because it's in Ephesians. You know, we took it out over here in Colossians. It's not in, in Colossians 1.14, but it's in Ephesians. You know, like that's supposed to make it okay. Kind of like a thief saying, you know, well, I, I did take, you know, I got your wallet from you and I took, uh, you know, half of the money that was in it, but then I gave back your wallet with the other half of the money. You know, so I'm not a criminal. Uh, yes, you're a criminal because you took, you know, half the money. And here you have two verses that are saying very similar things. They both need to be in there. Why? Because that's how God wants it. Just as simple as that. But you say, you know, this thing of the blood, is, is the blood really that important? I mean, what's the big deal if they took out the blood there in Colossians 1.14? Is it really that important? Oh, yeah. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. You know, I had this heretic years ago. John MacArthur came out and he said, it's not the blood, it's the death. It really doesn't matter. Jesus could have been strangled, you know, and it, it still would have meant the same thing. You know, and he can say it because he's a scholar, you know. You know, he's a cult leader, you know. And he's going and using the Vatican-inspired Greek uh, to correct all Bibles, including the ones that he sells as his uh, study Bibles. He doesn't believe in any Bible. Just like a lot of these Alexandrian perverts. But let's look at how important the blood is here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 22. It says here, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, hmm, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purify, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that was that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Verse 17 is very important, and a lot of people don't understand this. This is the one that really nails the uh, non-dispensational believers. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. The book of Matthew, up until... Matthew chapter 28, basically, it's all Old Testament. And, you know, I've, I've said this before, if you're new to this, you know, you're probably going, huh? That's the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1 starts the New Testament. Well, it starts a collection of books called the New Testament. I understand that. But the actual New Testament doesn't come in until after the testator, the Lord Jesus Christ, until after he dies on the cross. So who's he speaking to in the book of Matthew? Most of the book of Matthew is written to Jews in the Old Testament. Very interesting. That's called rightly dividing scripture. That's why you see Jesus and he says, Go not to the lost or go not to the Gentiles, but only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he says to this guy sitting and stuff like this, or this guy's leprosy, and he goes, Go show yourself to the priest and do the sacrifice commanded by Moses. Mary, she has to give two turtle doves and you know and things, and there's a priest and there's a holy temple and things, a synagogue. See, we don't have that today. But they did there at that point in time, because it was still under the Old Testament. It's important to get that distinction. But you see there the very important thing there with blood. You say, well, what? I, don't, I still don't understand why is it so important to have blood. I mean, couldn't it just be the, the, the death there? Well, let me say it this way. If you looked at me and I was laying there, you know, and I was like this, you know, and you couldn't really come over and touch me or anything and take my temperature, take my pulse or anything, uh, would that convince you that I was dead? Maybe. But what would it be like if you saw me or somebody like me or whatever, and you see me there and there's just blood everywhere? And you look and you're like, man, that must be all their blood came out. Could I fake that? And you could see it was definitely my blood that had come out, not fake blood or something like that. You lose all your blood, you're dead. I mean, you could just, you know, fall down, be in a coma or whatever, laying there, you know, like that. 
and still be living, still be alive, still be brought back. But if you bleed to death, you're finished. So again, even from that, I mean, there's a, there's a spiritual aspect to the whole thing of the blood, which we'll be talking about it a little bit more here, but there's a spiritual thing there about the shedding of blood. But even just from a purely medical, physical standpoint, you have a body that loses all their blood. I mean, you get a soldier in battle, and he gets shot in the arm, and he's bleeding all over the place. you got to get a tourniquet around that thing quick and stop that blood flow. Why? If you don't stop the blood, they're going to bleed to death. All the blood's going to come out, and they're dead. There's nothing that you can do for them at that point in time. It might only be a, a small wound. I mean, there are people that will commit suicide by slashing their wrist. It's not that big of a cut, but it drains all the blood. And you get all that blood out of the, out of the body there, you're dead. See? So yeah, the blood's pretty important there. Let's continue. Verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood... For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath joined, enjoined unto you. Moreover, moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Look at verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. You cannot have sins remitted. You cannot have sins taken away unless there's bloodshed. You say, why would that be? That's the way God set it up. So yeah, somebody starts messing around taking blood out of the Bible. It's not the Holy Spirit telling them to do that. Next, go to Acts chapter 20. I'm going to show you another reason why that blood that was shed was so important and why that blood can wash your sins away. I mean, what would happen if I shed my blood right now for you people out there watching? Well, you'd probably get to watch me bleed to death, and that's about it. My blood wouldn't do anything for you. Even if you were here locally and I could cut my wrist or something, sprinkle my blood over top of you or whatever, I'd just get you dirty, you know? Then you'd have the task of burying me. <laughs> you know. What would it do? You say, well, I don't understand the point. The point is, brethren, my blood is corruptible. I'm a sinful man. My blood isn't going to do anything for you. You say, well, Jesus was just a man. No, Jesus was God. That's why his blood meant something. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now if you're a Jehovah's Witness or somebody else out there, Martin Richlingite or whatever, and you believe that Jesus Christ was not God, what do you do with that verse? If Jesus Christ was not God, then when did God shed his blood to pay for sins? He purchased the church with his own blood. Right there, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. What do you do with that? You see, the blood that Jesus Christ shed on that cross was God's blood. Eternal blood. A little bit different than what we have in our veins. You know, That's why it pays for your sins completely and totally. That's why it's very important to not take the blood out of the Bible. And the NIV takes the blood out in numerous places, as do all the other new versions as well. Let's go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going to write by it. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says here, "...wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence." having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Let's see, where am I at here? Now notice there it says, uh, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Question, do you know what God's will is for your life? 
I don't mean a general principle of, of, well, Christians, you know, or people in general, God wants us to be saved so that we can live in heaven when we die. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you personally, you the individual, not you meaning the family that's watching or whatever else. I mean you, you as an individual. Do you know what God's will is for your life? You say, well, I'm trying to find it. I, I don't, I'm kind of praying about that. And I'm trying to trying to understand the word, word of God and whatever else. I'm trying to get to it. Well, there's a very simple way that you can find it. Let me show you. Revelation chapter 4. A lot of people try to make this into this really big, difficult thing. You know, how to determine God's will. What is His will for my life? Actually, it comes pretty easily. If you know these two verses and you abide by them. Revelation chapter 4. Verse 11. Just two verses is all we're going to look at to determine God's will for your life. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What did it say there in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9? Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure... What are you doing in your life to please God? Are there some things that you could do that could please God? You say, well, yeah, I think it could. Okay, that's His will. That's His will for you. And let me show you the other aspect to this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18 says here, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So you're to do everything in your life to bring God pleasure, and then you're to thank God for whatever happens in your life. You say, you, you mean whatever happens that's good that brings Him pleasure. No, no, I didn't say that. It says, in everything give thanks, the good and the bad. Why? Well, Romans 8.28 we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If you are seeking to please God with your life, whatever happens in your life will lead to that, you know, God working His good will, His good pleasure in your life. God has reasons and things that, that He allows certain things to happen in your life, and at the time, you aren't going to understand it. I mean, I've experienced that thing a lot in my life. Um, many, many times I just thought to myself, why on earth would the Lord allow this thing to happen? You know, some things I still don't understand, by the way. It's not that I have it all figured out. But uh, there are times when I have seen, you know, uh, relationships I've had in the past with, with women and things, and, and I just, I don't understand why this happened and things. Now that I'm married, I do understand. Now that I'm married, I realize, oh, God had a much better wife for me than I would have had if I had married that woman. See, and that's just a basic one. I mean, you get ones like, um, you know, why did I get a flat tire when I had so much work to do that day? Didn't get my work done because I had a flat tire needed to be taken care of. Or, or I needed, you know, I just recently had to replace the starter on my truck. Why? You know, I don't have time to be taking a whole day off to go, you know, to a auto parts store and get a starter and then bring back here and get it underneath the truck and all this other stuff. But I did it. Why did the Lord allow that to happen? I don't know. He had a reason. I have no idea. You know? God has lots of things that will happen in your life. And as long as you're giving thanks for those things, and as long as you are seeking to please Him with your life, He will lead you into His perfect will. See, you know, my, my understanding of what the Lord has for me I'm not going to say, you know what, I'm going to bring pleasure to God by playing piano. I want to play beautiful hymns on the piano. Why? Because I couldn't play the piano to save my life. I'm not going to waste my time trying to play the piano. I tried musical things. I've never been very good with music and things like that. You know, I, I can't play an instrument, you know. Um, I remember hearing a guy say the one time, he's like, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, you know. Yeah, I can barely play the radio. <laughs> you know, the point is, I have no mu musical ability. So why would I waste time on that? You see? 
Um, maybe you have a musical ability. Maybe you could use that to bring pleasure to God. And then when He gives you those abilities and when you can bless people, you say, thank you, Lord. So what you do is you, when you go through life, you say, okay, Lord, what talents, what abilities have you given me? What can I do to bring pleasure to you? It's kind of like a, a child uh, comes along and they say, I'm going to try to cook something for my mommy and daddy. And they, they don't do a very good job. But you know what? They can clean the bathroom. They can do this. They can do that around the house to bring pleasure to their parents. And so they focus on that thing that they can do. And they do that. And it brings pleasure to the parents. See? That's how we are supposed to be with the Lord. You know, I don't know what your talents are. You have to figure that stuff out on your own. But you look and you see, what things could I do to bring pleasure to God? And can I give thanks for those things? Can I thank the Lord for these things, these events that happen in my life? Of course, the Bible says in everything, give thanks. So technically you can. But the point is, how do you find the will of God? By doing things for His pleasure and by giving thanks in everything. And you'll find the will of God. You'll find His perfect will. And of course, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I think it is, uh, where it talks about being unconformed to this world, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. So nonconformity is also very important. Because nonconformity is going to please God. If you conform to the world, you're not going to please God. But uh, let's go to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 says here that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Of course, that's a good verse for the rapture right there. You know, things that are in, you know, to gather together in one all things in Christ. See, we see the in Christ there. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the dead saints are in heaven with the Lord right now. They're not soul sleeping and they're dead and buried and they're waiting to come up or whatever. That's their body that's down there, but their soul and spirit is with the Lord. So they're in heaven and we which are alive and remain on the earth. See? And we're going to get together at the rapture. But uh, that's one thing you see there. But then the other one, the word dispensation. All right? Now, the word dispensation appears four times in your King James Bible. I'll read the references here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17 says, For If I do this thing willfully, I have a reward, but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Then we have Ephesians 1, 10 is the next one, which is right there. Then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. All right? And then Colossians 1, 25 is the last um, reference to dispensation in your King James Bible. It says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Okay? You say, well, what is a dispensation? I don't, you know, it's just a system of belief or something. No. Uh, actually, the word dispensation, uh, we're going to see here what it means. This is a good definition, I believe. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Definition number one uh, for dispensation is distribution, the act of dealing out to different persons or places as the dispensation of water indifferently to all parts of the earth. Number two, the second definition, the dealing of God to his creatures, the distribution of good and evil, natural or moral, in the divine government. Neither are God's methods or intentions different in his dispensations to each private man. Number three, the granting of a license or the license itself to do what is forbidden by laws or canons, or to omit something which is commanded, that is, the dispensing with a law or canon, or the exemption of a particular person from the obligation to comply with its injunctions. The Pope has power to dispense with the canons of the Church, but has no right to grant dispensations to the injury of a third person. Yeah, he just does it if he feels like it. A dispensation was obtained to enable Dr. Barrow to marry. Um... And then the fourth definition, that which is dispensed or bestowed, a system of principles and rights enjoined as the Mosaic dispensation, the gospel dispensation, including the former, the Levitical law and rights, and uh, lat the latter, the scheme of redemption by Christ. So 
there you have the fourth one there would be like your dispensational theology, the different dispensations in the Bible. But what does that mean, different dispensation? That just means what, how God is dealing with people in that particular time. God is dispensing things. Okay? Um, you know, it'd be like if, if a bunch of people came along to me and they said, Hey, you know, Brian, do you have something we can read? And I grabbed a bunch of books right here and I said, Okay, here's one for you. Here's one for you. Here's one for you. You know, now if I see, let's say a woman, I'm not going to give her um, a book on how to build a dream cabin, okay, or or uh, the traditional bow maker's Bible. You know how to make a bow and arrow. You know the traditional way. I'm not going to do that. A lot of these books are from you know my woodworking. This isn't all spiritual, you know, books here. By the way, if you haven't noticed that yet, but uh, I might give her a book on cooking. Or a book on uh, whatever, you know, whatever she has an interest in. You know, and I see some guy and, and he looks like a hunter. I'm going to give him a book on hunting stories from the 20th century or 19th century or something. See, you dispense according to the people. All right. And right now you have God dealing not just with the nation of Israel any longer, but now with all people. And so he dispenses salvation for this time period here is the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. You want to get saved? Whosoever will, let him come. See? But now, was it like that in the Old Testament? No. God was dealing with a nation. And they were going out and having physical battles. There were times that, you know, there would be sin in the camp and God would start punishing them and say, you need to kill that person that brought sin into the camp. And they'd take them without the camp and they'd stone them with stones and they'd die and God would be okay with them. We're not dealing that way anymore. See, God isn't dispensing that kind of a thing to us anymore. All right? So understand that the word dispensation is a Bible term and that you can understand it scripturally. Okay? The Bible is teaching that there are different dispensations, different times when God dispenses grace or whatever to people in different ways. All right, well, let's continue. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So in other words, your eternal destination there, you are predestinated to go to heaven after you first trust in Christ by an act of your own free will see when you trusting when you trust in something when you first trust in Christ that means that you are coming to God and saying okay I'm here how do I get saved believe in the Lord Jesus Christ now shall I be saved okay I trust in Jesus Christ it's your own action you see it's what God did for you but you have to come to him in a submissive, repentant state and say, okay, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. There's just no way. So I put my faith in Jesus Christ. So you first trust in Christ and then you get saved and you are on your way to heaven. You don't go to heaven as soon as you get saved. See, in terms of bodily. we we'll see about that You know, in the, later on here. I think it's another chapter actually. But you are predestinated to go to heaven when you die. See, how do you know that? Look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? Now you can learn three things from this verse. They, this verse 13 proves three different concepts uh, for our dispensation right now. Number one, salvation is connected to hearing written Scripture, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. All right. Now, that might be somebody just telling you about salvation, and they're quoting Scripture and whatever else. That might be somebody explaining what the Scriptures say. It could be a gospel tract. It could be preaching on the radio or preaching online or reading the Bible, you know, whatever. But salvation is always going to be connected 
to the written Word of God. That's why Satan attacks it so much. That's why Satan wants to get rid of this book. All right. The second thing you can learn is that you must trust the Scriptures before belief can come. John chapter 8, verse 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Yeah. I mean, how can you say I'm a Christian and yet deny written Scripture? Doesn't make much sense. 1 John chapter 2. Turn over there. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. I'm going to look at this. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. What did we read at the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 1 there? How did the whole thing start out? How many references? You know, 10 references to this? In Christ. Our inheritance is based upon you being in Christ. You say, how do I know if I'm in Him? Very simple. What's your attitude in regards to the book? The Bible. Well, I'm a Christian and I believe in Jesus, but I hate the King James Bible. I don't believe in any Bible, actually. I believe all Bibles are filled with mistakes and errors. Um, that doesn't work. If you want to know that you are in Jesus Christ, then you have to believe His commandments. You say, well, it's just a concept, Brian. It's just the, the, the commandments, the, the, the concept of the commandments. No, no, no. The commandments are written about here in this book. And you will see that the Word of God, the written Word of God, is connected with somebody's salvation. We just read about it there in Ephesians chapter 1. You can go back to Ephesians chapter 1 there from 1 John. The third thing that you can learn there from verse 13 is uh, that the Holy Spirit seals you by a promise that He makes. It says, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, John 6, verse 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Another good verse that proves eternal security. Both these verses, actually. Verse 13 here in Ephesians chapter 1 and John 6, 37. God will not cast you out. All right, and we've done many studies on the thing of eternal security. All right, it's right there. But look at verse 14 here in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, I have talked about that uh, in other studies, the thing of the redemption of the purchased possession. And I told the story of, of uh, the one time I had bought a motorcycle on eBay and it was at a dealership. It was a couple year old motorcycle um, but uh, they put a sold sign on that motorcycle and it was like a month or so till I could come down and get it and that bike sat there in the showroom with my name on it and see anybody could have come into that showroom there and said I want that motorcycle doesn't matter why it's sealed with that holy not holy but it's sealed with that promise right there it's got a name on it it's paid for completely paid for it's already paid for. It's already purchased. All we're waiting for is the owner to come and redeem his purchased possession. That's what you are, Christian. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He purchased us with his own blood. God did. Read about that in Acts chapter 20. We are purchased. We are already bought. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You say, well, then why, isn't God, why didn't he just take us right to heaven? Oh, well, he's waiting for the right time for that. But you know what? That time's going to come, and that redemption of the purchased possession is going to come. We're going to leave, you know. But it's interesting there, it says in the last part of the verse, under the praise of His glory. You know, it's kind of funny, you get these uh, worldly, charismaniac, and 
any of the Babel buildings now almost are getting so charismaniac you can't even tell them apart anymore from the Pentecostal charismaniacs. But, uh, you know, they talk about these praise services, praise and worship music, you know, and you see these people you know, lifting their hands to the rock music and everything else. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You know, and they, they have laser lights in there and, you know, that video I did on Tomorrowland, you know, almost looks like a lot of the modern churches out there. But, uh, you know, lasers and all this praise and worship, horrible music and all this stuff like that. And the people, oh man, we had a great praise service. Um, no, you had a bunch of worldly junk. But let me tell you something, there's going to come a day when we're going to have a true praise and worship service. I mean, think about it for a minute. Things are getting worse and worse all the time. I mean, there's just horrible news and just bad things and you know and you can just you can feel the the evil building you know if you're a bible believer i mean you can feel it you can just look and you can say there's all this talk of uh you know i've heard recently here the ebola thing you know that there's a, a danger of ebola you know and i saw some guy saying that there could be as many as 200 million people die in america and i don't know whatever there's all these viruses and illnesses and flu vaccines and all this other bad stuff you know and it's like you get that and then you get like all the illegal immigrants coming into the nation there's like all oh, there's muslims that are coming in and you get all these islamic people and you know islamic takeover of america and you see all the atheists and all of this and of that and the catholics getting more powerful and all these different things the sodomites of course get more and more powerful all the time more and more states bowing to the sodomy, uh, sodomite marriage agenda. You know, you see all this stuff and it's just like, you know, you feel like, oh boy, you know, they're kind of, the enemy's starting to surround us. This is not getting good here. This is going to be kind of bad, you know, and all of a sudden that day's going to come and you're going to hear your name, sound like a trumpet calling you and it's going to be come up hither and we're gone. And there you are. We're in the clouds. You blink your eyes. You open your eyes, and there we are in the clouds. The Bible says in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. You know, so twinkling of an eye is like a, an eye blink. Boom, like that. And you open your eyes. We're in the clouds. You look down. Incorruptible body. And you look over there. There's the Apostle Paul standing there. There's D.L. Moody. There's, and you're going, oh, well, hey, hey, oh, hey, like this and stuff, you know. And you're looking at all these Christians and stuff. There's Peter, there's John, you know, and, and you know, all these great Christians down through the, the centuries and things like this. And you're, you're looking around and you're like, wow, wow, wow. And then here comes Jesus Christ. And we're all just going to say, ah, whatever. You know, I'm going to talk here with my friends and things like that. I don't think so. You know what we're going to have? The praise of His glory. He just came and, uh, you know, redeemed us. Now, when I went down there to the state of West Virginia to get my motorcycle years ago, the motorcycle wasn't like, hey, you know, it's just a piece of metal there, you know. But uh, what would it have been like to have an adopted child and to have that adopted child someplace at an orphanage and they're waiting and waiting and waiting for the day that their new parents are going to come, the new father that they had that purchased them, and all of a sudden that day comes. That child's there in that orphanage, and the father shows up. And the child realizes, now I'm going to my new home. Will that be a glorious day? Oh, yeah. That's what we're going to have someday. It's going to be wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Now let's look at verse 15 and 16 here in Ephesians chapter 1. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You know, that's a challenge because it's not always easy to love other Christians. <laughs> you know, sometimes you get other Christians that do some really dumb things and stuff like that and and it's it's hard sometimes, you know. I mean, I, I realize that there's a lot of false converts out there and, and things, you know. And and I've had some people that I just I kind of scratch my head and go, you know, I, I guess they're saved. I don't really know if they're saved, or whatever. And you know, I've I've been, you know, had some issues with different people down through the years. But I see them. I see that they're still in ministry, and 
I see they're still doing the work of the Lord and whatever else. You know what? I need to love them. Not be bitter. You say, well, you know, you, you had a disagreement with brother so-and-so and you had a disagreement with this sister, that brother, or whatever else. Are they saved? They still doing the work of the Lord? Yeah? Okay. Then get over it. Love them. And you know what it says there? Verse 16, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Do you pray much for the brethren? Prayer can be a difficult thing at times. I mean, especially if you're doing it right before you go to bed. You know, half the time it's like falling asleep, you know, while you're doing it and whatever. And, and uh, it can be difficult, but you're supposed to. We're supposed to pray for one another. And I do try to pray for a lot of you out there. I, I oftentimes, I, I can't, you know, it's gotten to the point now where, you know, I think we're over 7,500 subscribers now. And obviously I can't pray for each of you by name. It'd take me a while. But, you know, I do pray for the Lord's blessing upon all of you and that He would keep you in His Word. Not keep you, you know, in submission to me. You know, I don't want Denlingerites. I want Bible believers. You know, I want to know that my brothers and sisters out there in Christ can survive without me. You know, be challenged by me. Enjoy my preaching. Be blessed by, you know, whatever. That's fine. I thank the Lord for that when I hear about that. But um, I'm not your God. I'm not your official high priest or something like that. Whatever. You know, <laughs> stay in the book. You know, it's the Bible. But um, I do appreciate your prayers and I do pray for you. Well, let's look at verse 17 through 19. It says here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Revelation. Remember that. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of, his, of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. You say, well, uh, what do you see from those verses there? Well, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, what is revelation? You say, well, it's the last book of the Bible. Yes, it is, but it's also a description of something. I mean, if I... Okay, I'll just do it like this. Uh... Trying to find a good book to do this with here. Okay. I hope you didn't see that. All right. Now, what's the book that I have? So I don't know, Brian, you're covering it up. Okay. Do you have a better clue now? You say, well, I can kind of see the bottom of it there. How about now? How about now? See? See, I still can't see it. Well, you know, it's about money there, you know, currency. Old book about currency and stuff like that. I bought this at a used bookstore because it had an interesting quote in it by George Washington about, you know, a country that has paper money as their currency is, is a country of slaves. So I thought that was interesting. But you say, what was the point of that, Brian? The point of it is you can't see this thing at first because it's covered. But as it gets more and more revealed... Now you can see it more clearly. And in like manner, us living here in these end times, you know, years ago, it used to be that, you know, my friend and I, I had a friend from high school, and we'd, we'd hang out and stuff back when I was still living in Pennsylvania. And um, we'd hang out and everything, and, and we'd look for articles in the newspaper that would kind of deal with Bible prophecy, and we'd find one once in a while. And, you know, it got to a point, this is back in the 1990s we'd do this, but it got to a point, you know, that it was just like, why even bother cutting out news articles that prove Bible prophecy? It's just on a daily basis now, multiple times a day. You know, it's just an insult to, to any Christian out there. I mean, oh, do you think we're in the end times? It's like, yes, obviously. I mean, it's just incredible, all the Bible prophecy that is being revealed. You say, well, why is it that... Uh, why is it some people can't see that, that they profess to be Christians? Well, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, 
that ye may know what is the hope of the call, of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You know, and as time goes by and we see more and more Bible prophecy being fulfilled, you start to think more about the inheritance. You start to think more about the riches that we have coming to us. Not because I want to get out of here and, and go have my, you know, special gold, you know, the gold streets and everything. That's not the main thing. That's just the added bonus. The main thing right now is I want to get out of this world before it gets much worse. <laughs> You know, it's insane now. It's crazy. But let me show you the importance of Bible prophecy. Keep your hand there in Ephesians because we'll be coming back there. But go to 2 Peter chapter 1. There are some real foundational scriptures in your King James Bible. And this is another one of them. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 through 21. This is what separates us from all other religions. Okay, this is what separates this book, this King James Bible, from any other holy book out there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 21 says, we, we, excuse me, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. More sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Interesting. What did we read earlier there in Ephesians chapter 1? Verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. How do you confirm that this is the word of truth? How do you confirm that this King James Bible is actually God's written word? You know how? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have, a, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. You see, if this book is written by the creator of the universe, the creator of the universe would be able to see eternity past to eternity future. He wouldn't be constrained in time like we are. So he'd be able to tell you what's going to happen in the future. And you know, that's what really separates us from everybody else. You don't see much prophecy in the Quran. You don't see much prophecy in the Catholic catechisms or the Hindu scriptures or whatever else. And if they are, they stole them from the Bible. You know, the Quran came out after the New Testament or is written after that by Muhammad and his devil buddies. You know, but the fact of the matter is we have a more sure word of prophecy. And you're, the eyes of your understanding, when you get saved, you look and you go, Whoa, this is really crazy. And let me ask you another question. How many of you out there got saved because of end times prophecy? I'll raise my hand on that one. I got saved because I could see that the world was getting worse. You know, and all of a sudden I started to realize, hey, you know what? I probably should make another place my home than this earth. I see things getting worse and worse and worse, and I'm not going to keep pretending that they're getting better. And all of a sudden, I started looking at the Bible a lot differently. And at the time, you know, I was using new versions. I had no idea. And all of a sudden, it's like I started to hear about the Bible version issue, and I got to reading the King James, and I got saved. I got scared. Why? I knew what was coming. You see, I was starting to have my eyes opened to the reality around me. I was starting to break free of this phony baloney system here in America that, you know, the American dream is just always going to be here. We'll be here 2,000 years from now, riding around in spaceships like the Jetsons or something. No, that's not going to work. I mean, just the second law of thermodynamics, everything's going to get worse and worse with time. I mean, I've gone to, you know, driving and things like that, and I go past these cities and I see these polluted streams, and I say to myself, who's going to clean that up? You know, where are we going to put all this trash? Go past these landfills and you got this, looks like a mountain. And it's like, well, that's a big hill over there. Yeah, it's a big hill of trash and garbage, plastic. It's never going to rot. What are you going to do about that? See, you start to realize, hey, wait a second. Things are starting to get kind of bad here. And you look and you, you see all these trucks going and all the trains and all the airplanes and everything. And you say, this is all running off of fuel. That fuel's going to run out sometime. It has to. What are we going to do then? Huh. You see? All that stuff. 
you start to understand it. And through understanding end time prophecy, you say, hey, wait a second, the Bible says all this stuff is going to happen. Huh, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Then I better get saved. You hear the word of God, you understand Bible prophecy, you say, I need to get saved. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now let's look at uh, verses 20 and 21 here in Ephesians chapter 1. It says here, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Hmm. Very interesting. Keep your hand there and go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. It says here, For by him were all things created, talking about Jesus Christ, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. I'm reading to here, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Okay, so what's going on there? Well, verse 21 in Ephesians chapter 1 talks about how that Christ is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So Jesus Christ is God. You know, that's what the Bible teaches. And very interesting because if you are saved, then you are in Christ. You are plugged into Christ. Jesus Christ. And the interesting thing about that is everybody else is too. They're not saved, but everything in this world, it, the Bible said there in Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 17, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. They have their life from Jesus Christ. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? So let me ask you a question. You say, you see all these scary things coming? Yeah. There are some really bad things coming to this earth and, and things like that. But let me just give you a little bit of a convicting question here. Why are you afraid to of, of things or people or movements that are plugged into Jesus Christ for their power? I heard of a story the one time this uh, guy went into a bank to rob a bank. And he wasn't able to successfully rob the bank with the weapon that he brought. You know Why? Because he brought a chainsaw. You say, well, a chainsaw is a pretty scary thing. Well, it would be if it was gas, but you see, his chainsaw was electric. <laughs> and this stupid burglar goes into a bank and he's standing there, give me money or else, or else, and there's the plug hanging. Um, not really a danger to anybody unless it's plugged in. You see, it's very similar to the lost world. They're plugged into Jesus Christ. By him all things consist. So they start to come after you and the Lord says, hey, wait a second. No, you don't have my permission. And that lost person says, tough, I'm going in anyhow. The Lord goes, unplugs the problem. Do you think God can do that? Yeah, absolutely. You say, Brian, what about church history? I know, I know. I know about the Reformation you know, time there, the, the um, Inquisition and all that other stuff. I know about that. I've read about that. I've studied church history. I know that Christians have been martyred and persecuted horribly. I know about that. I know that other countries, things are really rough right now. I know that. But I also know that my God can protect me. You know? And you see, my purpose in life is to bring pleasure to the Lord and to do His will. And I know that the Lord wants me to speak the truth. And I know He'll take care of me. You know, and, th and there are times, you know, you just say, well, I can prove that you had a video where you said about you're afraid that they're going to shut your channel down and blah, blah, blah. There are times I falter. There are times that I kind of start to get fearful and I start to fear man and I start to think, oh, boy, this is not good. Oh, man. Sure, I'm a man. I'm not perfect. But you know what? As I was reading through this chapter here, I just thought to myself, you know, the Lord is in control of everything. 
you know, there's a thing, God's still on the throne. Well, that's, God's always going to be on the throne, you know. There's never going to be a time when the Lord's going to give up any of his power. He's in control. Don't worry about it. And, you know, am I anxious for the rapture? Yeah. Are you anxious for the rapture? I know a lot of you say yes to that, you know. Well, what's the Lord waiting for? I don't know. I guess somebody has to get saved yet. But, you know, that time's going to come, and we're going to be leaving. We will be redeemed as his purchased possession. He's going to say, okay, now, time, come on up. And that praise service that we're going to have at that point in time is just going to be phenomenal. Why? Well, because you go to any kind of a Babel building today, there's going to be a lot of the people in there aren't even saved. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot of flesh involved. Even if you could find a Babel building where everybody is saved, you know, you're going to have flesh involved. You're going to have people having pride issues and things. And I should have been allowed to sing because I have a better voice than that person. All that's it. Not in heaven. You see, we're going to get up there. We're going to have the mind of Christ at that point in time. So we're not going to be thinking that way anymore. So it's going to be the first true praise and worship service where it's done in truth and without any kind of pride or any kind of anything like that. A sinless praise and worship service is what we're headed for at the rapture. Looking forward to it. Very, very much looking forward to it. But let's finish up the chapter here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says here, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Don't ever forget that. There's no pastor, not Jack Hiles, if you've seen those studies. The IRS, through 501c3, they're not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And his glory, he's not about to give to anybody else. So you have some kind of a man, he's trying to take away the glory from the Lord and trying to get in between your, you and the Lord's relationship there. That's a problem. That's a big problem. All right. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. All right. By him all things consist. We are to give him glory. We are to bring him pleasure with our lives. That is his will. So that's going to be it for Ephesians chapter 1. It's a very interesting chapter. A lot of very important things there in this chapter that you can learn. and uh, But just very convicting. Um, the thing there towards the end, you know, about how that we do see prophecy in verses 17 through 19. You see the thing of your eyes being opened and you can see what's going on. And you're going, whoa, this is really bad. And we have a more sure word of prophecy. But then verses 20 through 23 says... You can see the evil, but don't forget who's in charge. Don't forget the Lord's got this whole thing planned out. All right, He knows exactly what's going to happen. He said, well, then, then he has everybody's plan, salvation planned out. No, I didn't say that. God has got the course of the world planned out. He knew that he would one day provide the way of salvation. And you see prophecies of the Lord being the means of salvation. You see them the whole way back in the book of Genesis. So... That's always going to be there. God's eternal purpose is there. But you getting saved is up to you. He's not going to force you to get saved. It's up to every man and woman out there to accept or reject Jesus Christ. And if you're watching and you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ, I pray you do it. You know, Not so that you can become part of a religious building system or something like that. No, 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 no. You're going to be part of the body of Christ, and He will be the head of your church, all right? The same church that those that are saved are part of. We don't meet in a physical building and call it a church. We are the church as the people, members of the body of Christ. So that's going to be it for Ephesians chapter 1. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the challenge from your word today. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you are in control and that you have promised that you will purchase us, Lord. We don't have to worry about you leaving us here or something because you really didn't want us after all and you changed your mind or something, Lord. I, I thank, that, thank you that you're not fickle like us, your creatures, are. That, that uh, you know things eternally and, and that your blood does pay for our sins. 
and guarantee us a place in heaven. I thank you, Lord, so much for that. And Lord, I do ask that you would please take us out of here before real long. Um, there's so many reasons for that, Lord, that yes, the evil is building and, and it's so vexing, Lord. As, as your word talks about Lot, that he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds, Lord. That is, it is very true for us today. We are so vexed by all that goes on and and um, we know a lot of it, Lord, we just aren't going to be able to change because it is prophesied in your word. So, Lord, I pray that you would please, in your time, that you would take us away. And uh, we do look forward to that time, Lord, when we will be able to praise you in sincerity and in truth. And all united as one body for the first time ever. All that are in heaven and, and those that are in earth. And we will bring you praise and glory for all of eternity. And I certainly look forward to it, Lord. And I just uh, thank you so much for your word. And, and I pray that all of us would be diligent about the work that you would have us to do in the time that we have left. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. That will be it for Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to be doing the rest of the six chapters here over the next couple of weeks. I uh, might take a break in one of the weeks or, or so. I'm not sure yet. I have a couple uh, sermon requests that I need to get taken care of. Um, had to get that Jack Hile study done. That thing was just like a, you know, a lot of these studies, you know, will take me many months to complete because I'm just finding out more and more information and there's a whole lot of other things that come before it, and it, but it's like I'm finding more and just kind of putting it over in that file, you know. And I'll actually have files, folders on my desktop where I have pictures and videos and articles and whatever else. I'll have that folder there, and then I keep throwing things into that, and eventually, you know, it becomes a study. But uh, I wanted to get that study done just simply to show people the you know, the truth of that cult that they had there, but also to expose this whole thing of easy believism, where it came from. So that's done. And uh, I thank the Lord for all those that have, you know, commented positively and, and said that, you know, it was a blessing to see that the truth of that whole situation. But uh, going to have a bunch of different projects coming up here. So don't want to spoil any surprises or anything else. And and I, I still have some, you know, I, a lot of times I'll listen to older messages and I'm like, I hear me saying, you know, I'm going to do a study on such and such. And I'm thinking, and it was like a year ago and I still don't have it done. So I'm going to try to get better about that, try to take care of some of the older things I said I was going to do. So going to be that's going to be interspersed with this expository study of Ephesians. Uh, of course, there's a lot of work to do at the ministry headquarters. Um, I just... The normal average stuff that you have to take care of and, and whatever else so uh, please keep praying for the ministry and uh, I guess that's gonna be it for this week so we will see you next week with Ephesians chapter 2